The title of the sermon this morning is The Pursuit of Godliness. If you want to open up your worship guide and take some notes, The Pursuit of Godliness. The Bible commands us to pursue godliness. 1 Timothy 6.11 says to pursue godliness. And so this morning, we're going to do a study, a Bible study, on godliness. What does it mean to be godly? What is godliness? How do you pursue it? What does it mean to pursue godliness? And we're going to look at what I have found to be the definitive passage in the Bible on the subject of godliness. This passage is just jam-packed with information about that topic, about the topic of godliness. And so you're going to learn all about it this morning. You're going to learn what godliness is and and how to pursue it, how to grow in it. And uh, it's going to be a good study. Our passage is 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. It should be printed up there in your uh, worship guide. 2 Peter 1, verses 3 through 5. This is, I think, week four in our sermon series through 2 Peter, Make Every Effort. And you'll see those words, make every effort, in this passage. It says this, His divine power, God's power, has given us everything required for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. By these, in other words, by His own glory and goodness, He has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. For this reason, for this very reason, make every effort to supplement or to add to your faith goodness, goodness with knowledge. And then it goes on, actually, there's a total of nine virtues that we'll end up looking at together. So this passage has at least six truths that I'm going to point out about godliness. If you're taking notes, the first truth about godliness is that it is God's will for you to be godly. It's God's will. He says in in verse 3, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. Well, the implication there is if, if God has given us everything we need to grow in godliness, then God obviously wants us to be godly. And this is reiterated in verses 5 through 7, which we'll see in a few weeks. As you continue reading, he says, add to your faith or supplement your faith with goodness and goodness with knowledge. And then he goes on, knowledge with self-control, self-control with endurance, endurance with what? Endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. And so uh, we're commanded here, twice in this chapter 1, to grow in godliness, to be godly. It says to, uh, in verse 5, supplement your faith with goodness, knowledge, uh, godliness, self-control, all these things. Supplement your faith with godliness. Now, what that means is that, obviously, God wants more from you than for you merely to believe. And that being a Christian is not merely about faith. Now, we'll talk about faith, I think, next week. We'll talk about the importance of faith and how to grow in your faith. But God wants more than your belief. Christianity is more than just belief. It's more than just orthodoxy or right belief. If you say you're a Christian because you believe certain things, that's not correct. Because Christians don't just believe things, they do certain things. It's about orthodoxy and orthopraxy, right doctrine and right behavior, right ethics. And so that's what he's saying. That's why he's saying supplement your faith with the following virtues. Because God wants more for us than for us to just believe. And then here's where I wanted to show you how often the Bible commands us to be godly. Uh, And I'm just going to run through some passages. I'm not even going to read. I'm just going to tell you what they say. I'm going to give you the references. Malachi 2.15, the Old Testament. The last book in the Old Testament, it says not only does God want you to be godly, but if you're a parent, God's will for you is to raise godly offspring, godly children. 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2 commands us to pray for our political leaders, our politicians, so that we can be free to live in all godliness. 1 Timothy 2, 2 through 3 says that godliness pleases God. 1 Timothy 4, 7 commands us to train ourselves in godliness. 1 Timothy 6.11 commands us to pursue godliness. Titus 2.12 
says that we're instructed to live in a godly way in this present age. 2 Peter 3.11 commands us to be people of godliness. And so godliness is not an option if you're a Christian. You are commanded, we are commanded to pursue, to grow in, to be godly people. That's what we're supposed to be as a Christian. A Christian is a godly person. And so the question is, is are you godly? And are you pursuing godliness? Number two, here's the second truth about godliness, is that you have everything you need to grow in godliness. You have everything you need to grow in godliness. Look at uh, verse 3 again. 2 Peter 1.3 says, His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. And so God has given you everything you need to be all that he's called you to be. God has given you everything you need to be a godly man or a godly woman. You have everything you need. And, and what resources has God given us? Let me give you eight of them real quick. It was kind of some rapid fire. What are some of the resources that God has given you to help you grow? The first one is a new heart. When you become a Christian, you get a new heart. It's called being born again. And what makes this a new heart is that all of a sudden, you're, you now want to please God, and now you find yourself having strength to please God. Whereas before, you weren't concerned with pleasing God. That wasn't a priority of yours or even a desire of yours. But you get this new heart, and all of a sudden, you find yourself wanting to please God. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27 says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my ordinances. And that's why if you're truly a Christian, you can only backslide, backslide for so long and you can only run from God so far before God pulls you back in because you're his and he's given you this new heart and you want to please God. You cannot help it. You want to please God. You want to love him. So he's given you a new heart. As well, he's given you the indwelling Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. The moment you become a Christian, God baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. That means he puts the Holy Spirit to live within you. Jesus does it, actually. Jesus places the Holy Spirit to live within you, and he doesn't leave you. He's there to stay. But you say, well, what about whenever I sin? You, know, you grieve him, but he doesn't leave you. It's upsetting to the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit who lives within you whenever you sin, but he doesn't leave you. And the Holy Spirit is giving you power and strength and motivation and conviction to grow. John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father, this is right before he left the earth, before he ascended into heaven, before he died and, and rose again and ascended. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another counselor. That's what he called the Holy Spirit, the counselor, to be with you. How long? Forever. He doesn't come and go. He stays. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. The moment you become a Christian, you get the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is growing you. In fact, uh, 1 Peter 1, 2 says the Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies us. That's the big theological word for spiritual growth, sanctification. It means he's setting you apart from sin and setting you apart for God and for God's use. The Holy Spirit is the one who does that. It sanctifies us. A third resource that God gives us to grow is the Word of God. God's Word, the Bible. We grow through the Bible. John 17, 17, Jesus said, sanctify them, that is, grow them. How? By the truth. Your Word is truth. We grow through knowledge and understanding and obedience of the Word of God. And God has given us his word. Fourth is the gift of prayer. God has given us prayer. That's another resource that he's, that he's given us. Um, in John 14, 13, Jesus said, Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And so you can pray for godliness and God will answer your prayer. God, help me to grow in godliness. That's a prayer that you know God wants to answer. And so... You'll, he will always answer that in the affirmative. A fifth resource is the encouragement of the church. God has given us the encouragement of a church family to help us grow. God 
uh, did not save you and make you an orphan. He saved you and said, okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I want you to find a church, get in a church family, and you receive tons of resources, spiritual resources, by being a p- part of a church family that helps you grow in godliness. Ephesians 4.16 says this, He, Christ, makes the whole body fit together perfectly, the body of Christ, as each part, you're a part of the body of Christ, as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts what? It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. And so as you're doing your part in the church, and I'm doing my part in the church, we're all doing our part. We're all helping each other grow. Uh, A sixth resource that God gives us to help us be godly is the discipline of God. God's discipline, his hand of discipline. Our Heavenly Father is not a permissive Father. He spanks us whenever we disobey him, and that's good for us. Uh, The most well-behaved children are children with an authoritative mother and father who don't just let them do whatever they want to do. Parents who spank them and discipline them. And that's what God does for us. How does God discipline us? Well, he uses suffering. He uses pain. And it doesn't matter who causes the pain or why you're in pain. It could be just because we live in a sinful world and so you're sick. It could be because you made a bad choice. It could be because you did something foolish. You didn't mean to do it, but you did something foolish. You just had lack of knowledge and wisdom. Or it could be you're suffering because of the sins of someone else. No matter why you're suffering, God uses that suffering as a form of discipline to help you grow. Look what it says in Hebrews 12, 7 and 11. It says, endure suffering as discipline. Okay, so every time you suffer, realize God is using that suffering to discipline you. Now, the word discipline comes from the word disciple, which means learner. God's not punishing you. He's trying to teach you. He's trying to help you grow and develop. So endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons, as children. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? No, discipline seems enjoy, no discipline seems enjoyable at the time but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So how does God grow us through discipline? It's another gift that he gives us. And so if you're not being disciplined, then you're not a son. And sometimes you'll see unbelievers who seem to have it even easier than Christians. Everything just seems to be going smooth. Everything's great. And first of all, that's only going to last for so long. Because eventually sin catches up. But the second thing is, it's because God is not disciplining them. They are not his children. You become a child of God when you put your faith in Jesus Christ. You're born again. And so God will discipline you. And he will spank you. And he will make you miserable until you grow and come back to him. And then another resource that God gives us to grow us in godliness is the intercession of the Holy Spirit. That's a big word, intercession, that means to pray for someone. So if I intercede for you, I'm praying for you. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit prays for you. Now that's hard to understand. We're talking about the Trinity here. How does God pray for you? (laughs) Well, the Holy Spirit is asking, I guess, Jesus to help you. He's asking God the Father to help you. But this is what it says in Romans 8.26. In the same way, the Spirit also helps us in our weakness because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And so the Holy Spirit is always praying for you. What's he praying for? Well, probably lots of things, but one thing for sure, he's praying for you to grow in God. He's praying for you to grow spiritually. And then there's one more resource I wanted to point out, and that's the intercession of Christ. Christ is also interceding for you. He's also praying for your spiritual growth. Look what it says in Romans 8.34. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. So Jesus is in heaven right now praying for you, praying to God the Father for you to grow in godliness. And so what this means is if you have everything you need to be godly, then that means you can be godly. 
you can grow in godliness. You don't have to stay stuck in that addiction. You don't have to stay stuck with that bad attitude. You know, there are a lot of Christians that they hear a sermon, hey, you need to grow in godliness. You need to repent of this sin or that sin. And they try and they fail and they try and they fail and then they give up. And they say, well, I I know some people obviously reach, you know, a level of godliness. Some people get past this pattern, this behavior, but I guess I just can't do it because I've tried and I've failed and I've prayed for it and it still hadn't happened. But the truth is, if God has given you everything required, then you can be godly. You can grow. And we'll talk about how to do that uh, later on in the message. But you can. Do not give up. Do not give up the pursuit of godliness. Okay, number three. A third truth about godliness from this passage is that you have everything you need for godliness through the knowledge of Christ. Through the knowledge of Christ. That's what it says in in the passage. You have everything you need for godliness through the knowledge of Christ. That's an important point. How do you know if you have everything you need for godliness? How do you know? How do you know if the Holy Spirit is inside of you? How do you know if you have a new heart? How do you know if Jesus is interceding for you and if the Holy Spirit is interceding for you? How do you know if you're a son of God so that God is disciplining you? How do you know? Well, you know... If you're saved, if you're a Christian, if you have saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's what that word knowledge here is talking about, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, then you have everything that is required. Here's what it says in in 2 Peter 1, 3. His divine power has given us everything required for life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him who called us. Now, this word knowledge is referring, again, to salvation, to not not just knowing things about Jesus. It's talking about this saving knowledge, this experiential knowledge, this intimate knowledge. You know Christ. In other words, if you're a Christian, then you know God and you know Jesus in ways that unbelievers don't know. Unbelievers, in fact, even demons and the devil. The devil knows way more about God than you do. The devil knows way more theology than you and I ever could but he doesn't know Jesus like you do if you're a Christian. You know the Lord Jesus Christ. You have a relationship with him, a real saving relationship with him. This is how Jesus said it. He uses the word knowledge here or the word know, which is the word gnosis in Greek, G-N-O-S-I-S. He says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God and the one you have sent, Jesus Christ. So what does Peter mean that we receive everything required for godliness through the knowledge of him who called us? He's talking about the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you've been saved, then the moment you get saved, God gives you everything required right then and there. You have all that you need. Now, I want to get into some some differences among denominations and among Christians and why this is an important subject. Because some denominations in the tradition of John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism, and who was very, very admirable and respectable and and very inspirational, a great Christian, but he had some bad doctrine. But many of the denominations that are in the tradition of John Wesley believe that you need a second experience after salvation. You need a second experience subsequent. That's what that means, is after salvation in order to get everything you need for life and godliness. In other words, they say you don't have everything you need for godliness just because you're a Christian. You need something else. You don't have everything required to be godly just because you're a Christian. You need a second experience. You need a second blessing, if you will. Now, Methodists and those in the Methodist tradition Uh, In the Wesleyan tradition, they refer to this as Christian perfection or entire sanctification. Raise your hand if you've heard of that. Entire sanctification or Christian perfection. It's an experience, a second experience after salvation. And here's what they say. They're not talking about that you can become perfect. The idea is that you can overcome or you can get the power to overcome voluntary, willful sins. 
by getting this second experience, which they, which they call Christian perfection or entire sanctification. So entire sanctification is this experience that you receive by the Holy Spirit in which he breaks, the Holy Spirit breaks the power of sin in your life so that now you have this power. Now you're walking in freedom. Now you're no longer committing voluntary sins. Now you're no longer purposefully, willfully, knowingly committing sin anymore. Sure, you might commit sins unknowingly and, and, and with your attitude and with your temper and things like that, unintentional sins, but no longer are you going to commit those intentional voluntary sins. Does that make sense? And so they say to get to that point, all you have to do is have this experience. It's not about spiritual growth. It's not about reading your Bible and going to church and being obedient. And it's about having this experience. That's what Methodists believe. And there are several steps that you need to take to have this experience. Would you like to know what those steps are? All right. Number one, you have to believe that this gift is real. This gift of Christian perfection or entire sanctification. You have to believe that it's real. You have to believe that it's available to you as a Christian. Number two, you need to forsake all known sin in your life. Number three, you need to surrender yourself completely to God's control. Those sound like good things. We believe in that. Third, you need to pray for this experience. You need to pray for entire sanctification or Christian perfection. God, please give me that. And then you need to have faith that God loves you and that he's going to give it to you, that he wants you to have it. And then you'll have it. And then some in the Wesleyan tradition believe that this is an emotional experience, that you'll actually feel it. You'll, you'll have this emotional fuzzy, this warm fuzzy. Something will happen to you physically. Others teach that um, you just have to receive it by faith. Don't look for any kind of a, uh, um, an emotional experience or any kind of a physical experience. Just receive it by faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, is what they would say. So that's what those in the and the Wesleyan Methodist tradition. Now, others who also come from John Wesley's heritage are actually Pentecostals and Charismatics. They are actually breakoffs from Wesleyanism and from John Wesley and his teachings. And so they believe something similar, but Pentecostals and Charismatics, um, Church of the Nazarene, for example, they don't teach entire sanctification or Christian perfection. They teach Baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the term that they use, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And to Pentecostals and Charismatics, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something you experience when you get saved, but it's something you experience later on. It's a second, subsequent blessing. It happens after salvation sometime, and you have to seek it. And the way you seek it is exactly the same way that Methodists would seek entire sanctification or Christian perfection. You have to believe that the, gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a real deal and, and that God wants you to have it. You need to forsake sin and surrender yourself completely to God. You need to pray for it and have faith that God is going to give it to you. And what Charismatics and Pentecostals, many of them, what they believe is that when you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you will speak in tongues. You'll speak in other languages. And sometimes you'll also experience other phenomena You'll be slain in the spirit. You might just fall back and just completely lose control of your body. You might be shaking and rolling on the floor. You might get holy laughter and you can't stop laughing. Uh, but you have to have this experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit sometime after salvation. And you can have it multiple times because you can lose it. You can have it multiple times. And uh, then when you get Christian perfection or entire sanctification, when you have that experience or when you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you have everything required for godliness. But this is not what the Bible teaches. 2 Peter 1.3, again, I want you to notice this verse. It's so important for this particular um, topic. His divine power has, past tense, has given us everything required for life, that's talking about eternal life, and for godliness, for the Christian life, to be godly. And we'll talk about what godliness means in just a minute. Through the knowledge of him who called us. How do you get it? Not through a baptism of the Holy Spirit, not through some second subsequent experience, but through the knowledge. In other words, when you come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, saving knowledge of God, then God gives you everything required. And of course, 
what many uh, in the Reformed tradition, in the Baptist tradition, what they believe about, what we believe about the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that that's, you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit the moment you get saved. That What the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is when Jesus places the Holy Spirit to live in you. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Think about the word baptism. The word baptism and the concept of water baptism. Water baptism happens when in your Christian life? At the very beginning, right? Well, in the same way, spirit baptism happens at the beginning of your Christian life, the moment you get saved. And then water baptism, how many times do you do it? Once. Same thing with spirit baptism. The moment you become a Christian, Jesus baptizes you with the Holy Spirit, placing the Holy Spirit within you to live in you forever. And so you don't need to get baptized in the Spirit over and over and over again. You're baptized once. Now, the Bible does command us to be filled, be continuously being filled with the Holy Spirit. But that's not a feeling uh, necessarily. That's just you need to, as you live in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit fills you. You need to know that you have everything you need for life and godliness right now if you're a Christian. And it's not about how much of the Holy Spirit do you have. It's about how much of you does the Holy Spirit have. The more of yourself that you hand over to the Holy Spirit's control in obedience and submission, the more the Holy Spirit is able to empower you for Christian living. That's how it works, okay? And that's why John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was teaching about Jesus, John the Baptist said, he is the one who will baptize you with the Spirit. You can look that up in the early portions of the Gospels. That's what he was talking about. Is Jesus, what he does is baptizes us with the Holy Spirit when we put our faith in him. Does that make sense? Okay, number four. The fourth truth about godliness in this passage is godliness means sharing in the divine nature. Godliness means sharing in the divine nature. So now we're getting into the definition. We've been talking a lot about godliness without even defining what is godliness. What does that mean? And it tells us in this passage, it defines it for us. It says uh, in, in verse 4, 2 Peter 1, 4, by these, by God's glory and goodness, which he referred to in the previous verse, he has given us very great and precious promises. These promises, are he, what he's referring to is all the resources that God gives us, enabling us to be godly. So by his glory and goodness, he has given us these very great and precious promises, all of the resources we need, so that through them you may share in the what? And the divine nature. And so godliness means sharing in the divine nature. Now what does that mean? What's the divine nature? It doesn't mean that godliness means becoming little gods. It's talking about God's moral nature. God created us to be like him morally, to be images of his moral nature, to reflect his moral nature. That's what it means to glorify God. And so what it's saying is earlier it said, in verse 3, it said, God has given us by his power everything required for life and godliness. Then it goes on and it says, it explains what godliness is. It says, he has given us all these resources so that we can share in the divine nature. Godliness is sharing in the divine nature. It means God-likeness or Christ-likeness. Godliness means becoming like Christ, becoming like God in your morality, in your character, your conduct, and in your convictions. That's what it's talking about. And over and over again in Scripture, we know that we're called to become like God, become like Christ. Ephesians 5.1 says, therefore be imitators of whom? Of God. Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children. 1 John 2.6 the one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked, okay? Now, something that I want to point out to you is that Peter seems to have two different definitions for the term godliness. And you can see this because he starts out in verse 3 saying that by his divine power, God has given us everything required for life and godliness. And then if you get down to verse, verses 5 through 7, he says, so since God has given you everything you need to be godly. So make every effort to supplement your faith with or to add to your faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, and godliness. Let me, let me try to help you see the problem here. Peter's saying God has given you every, everything you need for godliness. Therefore, make every effort to be godly. 
Now, what we find as you read through Scripture is that godliness is used in two different ways. Sometimes godliness means sharing in the divine nature. It means becoming like Christ. It's just a, an umbrella term that refers to cultivating all of the virtues, all of the fruit of the Spirit. You're becoming like God. So there's this umbrella term godliness. But then the term godliness, which we'll look at in a few weeks, can also more specifically mean the word piety or the word devotion or an intimate walk with God that results in a life that, that is pleasing to him. Now, how do you know whenever you're reading your Bible and you come across the word godliness, which definition to use? How do you know when you read the word godliness, is it talking about virtue, you know, Christ-likeness in general? Or is it talking about that particular virtue of godliness, that piety, that devotion, that intimate walk with God that results in a life that is pleasing to him? How do you know? Well, I'll tell you, it's a simple little, um, little principle that you can use. Whenever you read the word godliness and it's all by itself, then it's almost always talking about just godliness in general. Godliness in terms of becoming like Christ. But whenever you read the, the word godliness and it's found in a list of virtues then it's talking about the particular virtue of godliness, which is piety or devotion. Let me give you an example. 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. This is a very common passage about godliness. It says, But have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather, train yourself in what? Train yourself in godliness. For the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So godliness is here. Is it by itself or is it in a list of virtues? All right, since it's, it's not in a list of virtues, it's by itself here. And so Paul is talking about just the general concept of become like Christ. Become like Christ. But then later on in 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, 11, notice how godliness is used here. He says, but you, man of God, flee from these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. So do you see here how godliness now is in a list of virtues? It's not by itself. And so here, Paul is referring to the specific virtue of godliness, which means piety or devotion or that intimate walk with God. Okay? So... The definition of godliness can either mean, and both of them are so connected, they're so connected, uh, and they're so similar, but it, it, it can either mean Christ-likeness in general, becoming like God in your character, conduct, and convictions, or it can mean piety, a devotion, strong devotion, intimate relationship with God. All right, number five, quickly, two more truths about um, godliness. The benefit, now we're going to get to the benefit of godliness. The benefit of godliness is escaping the corruption of, of the world, escaping the corruption of the world. Now, godliness has many benefits, and we'll talk about them in a, in a few weeks, but um, Peter gives us a big one here in verse 4. He says, by these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature, escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desire. Now, that word corruption is the Greek word phthora. Try saying that one, phthora. Like, here's how it's spelled, P-H-T-H-O-R-A, phthora. And what it means is used nine times in the New Testament. It's translated as corruption and destruction and decay and ruin. And so when Peter says that by living a godly life, we escape the corruption of the world, he's not saying that by being godly, we merely get to escape sin. He's talking about by being godly, we get to escape the consequences of sin, the inevitable results of sin. I'm not talking about hell. I'm talking about the decay and the ruin and the destruction that sin causes in our lives. By living a godly life, you get to escape all of that corruption in the world. For example, I wrote down some, some of the types of corruption that are caused by sin, and these are very familiar to you, but these are some of the 
the types of decay and ruin and corruption and destruction caused by sin, depression, anxiety, stress, suicide, murder, violence, abuse, destructive addictions, self-caused illnesses and diseases, abortion, adultery, broken homes, fear of death, a wasted life, self-induced financial problems, discontentment and and unhappiness, and relational strife. These are many of the kinds of corruption that are in the world because of sin. And we get to escape those things by living a godly life. And this is why Jesus said in John 10.10 that he came to bring us not just life, but what? Abundant life, a full and meaningful life. And this is why in 1 John 5, 3, it says that God's commandments are not burdensome. It's because whenever we follow God's commands, it's a blessing. We get to escape the corruption in the world. You know, the, the, life is hard enough as it is. We live in a very sinful world. The devil's coming at us. Our flesh is sinful. We still desire sin because sin feels good in the short run, in the short term. Life is hard enough as it is. Christians and non-Christians have hard times and get sick and experience all those types of problems. But whenever we sin, we make life so much harder than it has to be. And so what Peter is saying here is by living a godly life, by sharing in the divine nature, we get to escape all of that corruption and all of that ruin. God made us. God made the world. God knows how, how the world works. And so we, when we live in alignment with God's will, we get to escape a lot of that mess. And then number six, growth and godliness requires making every effort. Making every effort. Now we're getting to the practical part of the sermon. If God has given us everything we need to be godly, then how come all Christians are not godly? Surely you know a Christian who's not very godly. Maybe you're that person. Maybe you've been that person before. Why is that? Well, notice what he says. By these he has given us very great and precious promises, so that through them you may share in the divine nature escaping the corruption that is in the world because of evil desires, for this reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. And then he's going to give us a list of of seven more virtues. And so those seven virtues are some of the specifics of how godliness is played out. But he says the way to grow. Here, here God has given you everything you need to be godly, so make every effort. So why is it that many Christians are not godly if God has given them everything they need for godliness? It's because godliness requires making every effort. What does that mean? The King James Version translates translates it, giving all diligence, all diligence. Commentator William Barclay said, we must bend all our energies. In the Christian life, the supreme effort of man must cooperate with the grace of God, the supreme effort. So here's what it means. On the one hand, God has given us everything we need. On the other hand, we have to give God everything we've got in order to become godly. It's like a boxing manager. A boxing manager can give his boxer everything he needs to succeed. He can give him the proper training and nutrition and skills and scouting reports and motivation and sparring partners. But for the boxer to become great, it's not enough for him to have all those resources. The boxer has to give his best. He has to make every effort to become a champion. It's the same with us. God has given us everything we need, but we have to apply elbow grease. We've got to make every effort. In other words, if you were hoping for some zapping experience. God to just zap you one Sunday so that you no longer struggle with temptation and with sin. You've come to the wrong place. That's not Christianity. It comes down to good old effort. Not effort to go to heaven, but effort to become godly. Striving with all of your heart 
to be the devoted Christian that God made you to be. Over and over again, the Bible tells us that the Christian life requires us to give our all. Luke 9.23 says to deny yourself and take up your cross. Luke 14.33 says if you don't renounce all of your possessions, you can't be a disciple of Christ. Luke 9.24 says if you want to save your life, you've got to lose it. Lose your life. Give it up completely. Luke 14.26 says that if you want to be a disciple of Christ, you have to hate your family and even your own life. Matthew 5, 29 through 30 says, if your eye causes you to sin, do what? Gouge it out and throw it away. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. Total commitment. Romans 12, 1 says to offer your, yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Mark 12, 30 doesn't just say to love God. It says to love God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Hebrews 12.1 says to lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. 1 Timothy 6.11 says run from evil and pursue godliness. That word pursue means to strive for, to chase, to try your best. And so the point here is not that God is worthy of our best effort. He is. It's not that we should give God our best effort. It's not that we should be putting our all into our Christian faith. It's that either we will or we'll fail. The Christian life, in terms of living the victorious Christian life, cannot be achieved half-heartedly. You will never progress in godliness without making every effort. It's because your flesh is too sinful and this world is too tempting and the devil is too crafty for you to grow without making every effort. It requires your all. And so you are as godly as you want to be right now. And you're as close to God as you want to be right now. God doesn't command us to pursue spiritual experiences. He commands us to pursue godliness, to train ourselves for godliness. And so stop waiting for God to zap you. And you need to train yourself. You need to pursue it with all your effort. So how do you pursue it? How do you pursue godliness? How do you make every effort? Real quick, five things. Number one, Bible study. Make every effort to know your Bible Make every effort. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Psalm 1, 2 says, instead his delight is in the Lord's instruction and he meditates it on it day and night. It's not enough for you to know your Bible. You got to be in it all the time. You need to be living in the word. Second, prayer. You need to become a prayer warrior, not somebody who just prays at church and, and before meals. A prayer warrior. Luke 18, 1 says, pray always. Ephesians 6.18 says to pray at all times. Colossians 4.2, devote yourself to prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says to pray constantly. Are you getting the idea? In other words, you need to be living in prayer. What are you praying for? Well, pray for godliness. Pray for God to grow you in godliness. And then third, obedience. Cultivating godliness comes down to good old obedience. Most Christians, the problem is not that they don't know enough. It comes down to obedience. They're not applying what they know. They already know they need to stop looking at porn. They need to stop smoking. They need to stop cursing or to stop stealing. They need to break up with their uh, girlfriend or boyfriend. They need to stop living with somebody that they're not married to. They need to stop having sex before marriage. They know these things. They're just not being obedient. James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. Fourth, fellowship. You need to be in church. You need to be an integral part of your church. You need fellowship with other believers. You cannot do the Christian life on your own. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. Why does it say to let us watch out for one another? It's because we need it. We need each other. And then finally, separation. Number five, separation. To overcome sin and temptation and grow in godliness, you have to separate yourself from those situations and those people that tempt you to sin. 
1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good character. Don't think that you're so strong that you can hang around bad people all the time and not be influenced. The world is much better at pulling us down than we are at pulling them up. You got to separate yourself. Sometimes you need to break up with that person. You need to find a different group of friends, find a different place to hang out, get rid of cable TV, get rid of the internet at home, stop watching those shows that tempt you. You got to separate yourself. Thomas Edison is the greatest inventor of the modern age, acquiring 1,093 patents. That man was busy. This is what he said. He said, failure is really a matter of conceit, of pride. People don't work hard because in their conceit, they imagine they'll succeed without ever making an effort. Most people believe that they'll wake up someday and find themselves rich. Actually, they've got it half right because eventually they do wake up. Spiritual growth or growth in godliness is a lot like that. The reason why a lot of people are not growing is because they're conceited. They're prideful. They think that they can achieve spiritual growth. They can achieve godliness just casually. That just eventually one day they'll wake up godly. And it doesn't work like that. You've got to put in all the work. You've got to make every effort or it's not going to happen. But let me tell you that the journey is worth it. The prize is worth it. Not as someone who has arrived, but it's somebody who is on the journey. It's worth it to make every effort. It's worth anything. Whatever you have to do, cut it off, throw it away, separate yourself because nothing is as important or as rewarding as making every effort to be godly. A few questions to close with. Are you godly right now? Would the people in your life describe you as a godly man or a godly woman or a godly young man or young woman? Are you making every effort to grow in godliness? If not, why? What adjustments do you need to make to begin making every effort to grow in godliness? And then how can I help? That's what I'm here for, to help you grow in godliness. So if I can help in any way, you let me know. You can put that on your connection card. You can send me an email, give me a call. But let me know how I can help you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this word on godliness. And Lord, help us, God, to get serious and to get to work and to stop making our, our relationship with you just kind of a, a side note just a part of our lives, Lord. Help us to reorient and recenter our lives around you and to put in everything that we've got into growing in Christ and to being the people that you want us to be and to sharing in the divine nature. Lord, give us that desire, that burning passion that we need to grow. Help us to put away sin so that we can escape the corruption of this world. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.